1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. The power behind the gospel. Uh, Brother Carl was pastor here, Carl Mullins, for three years when our church needed a boost, and he sure gave us a boost. Was a solid Bible man, and <clears throat> he had a lot of health problems, but he uh, stayed with us three years to get us on our feet, and uh, did a great job here. Baptized about, I think we baptized 45 people during his three years. Does that sound right? No, about 35. No. Yeah, it was about 40, 45. Mark was baptized. How many in here were baptized by Brother Carl? <coughs> Stand up in honor of Brother Carl. Since you... <laughs> Two. Okay. Very good. Amen. Thank you. And uh, he was a wonderful man, and Eileen was a wonderful pastor's wife. Brother Carl has gone on to his reward, 77 years old. He had a lot of bad health problems, and he doesn't have health problems anymore. And he was gave up a good job in Cincinnati, Ohio as a young man, a good-paying job, a supervisor's job in a factory in Cincinnati, and felt called to preach and quit the job with children and a wife and went to college went to Clear Creek Baptist College and got a degree so he could be a pastor. His dad was against it, his mother was against it, his brothers were against it, but he went on. Eileen supported him. That's why uh, God gives us these great women behind us, these great ladies that push us to be what we ought to be, right? But uh, just so thankful that he pastored about 10 churches over 40-some years. I'm just thankful that ours was one of them. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1-5, through 5, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom but in demonstration of the Spirit and of the power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. <clears throat> the power of an auto of automobile is not in the size or the appearance or the comfort of an automobile. It is hidden underneath the hood. That's the power of an automobile. The power of a human body is not size, beauty, or intelligence. It's hidden inside the body. What you see is not always what you get. You see a great big powerful ship that sits there empty. Its power has been cut off. It's just a lifeless hulk. It looks impressive. Its appearance is awesome, but it's powerless. A man can appear to have all the right answers, all the right words, all the right things, all the right motives, but who or what is the power behind that man or woman? That was Paul's contention in our passage today. Who empowered the Apostle Paul? That makes all the difference. Who is the power behind the man? In our world today, we're getting ready to elect a president in November, if the world survives till then. If your family, if family members live in a major city, you better get them out, I'm telling you. We're just seeing the beginning of racial unrest. I think it'll calm down, but it will be something that we'll never, ever have peace about. There'll never be peace in this world until the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, rules and reigns. Amen. And then, and only then, we will we have peace and mankind will get along with one another because right now we're sinful, fallen. And the people are getting messages all the time. They're getting a line fed to them and they're getting uh, Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter and whatever else they can be fed and all the propaganda. Uh, when a person, a Secretary of State who can... Uh, or uh, not jumping on her, I'm talking about the James Comey, the FBI director who protects us from all enemies, foreign and domestic, says it's okay to 
commit crimes against this country, then we've got the wrong message. He got a message from someone else, didn't he? He's just the messenger. You can say all you want that he just did what he had to do. He did the right thing. Well, he's somebody behind the scenes. And that's why we're talking about the Apostle Paul. Who was behind Paul? Who was the, pass the, the power behind Paul? 1 Corinthians 2, 1 again, And I, brethren, when I came to you, uh, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Even though it is not the messenger, the message must be a fit, the messenger must be a fit vehicle. In other words, he must be saved by the grace of God under the guidance of the Holy Spirit if you're going to talk about Jesus Christ. The messenger has to be a fit vehicle for use. That is, it's got to be someone who is born again and is filled with the Holy Spirit of God and is following the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, just about anyone can claim to have the Spirit of God upon them. Anyone can claim to be a preacher. How can we tell who's speaking the truth? That is the question of the hour. <laughs> How can we tell from politicians to government leaders to uh, bosses to whatever, Walmart workers, how can we tell who is speaking the truth? It's never about the messenger is one hint. It's never about the messenger. It's always their message. Now that doesn't mean their message is true. If the speaker is full of I, me, my, and jokes and stories, and I'm talking about the pulpit, beware. If the speaker behind the pulpit of a church is full of I, me, my, jokes and stories, beware. Now, of course, some jokes and stories are okay. But the focus cannot be on the messenger, but on the message. Paul was the second greatest preacher of all time. Jesus Christ was the greatest. But Paul was not a clever orator. Paul was not persuasive in his presentation. I had someone call me one time and said, Jack, I'd like to come and do a revival in your area. I guarantee decisions. I thought, are you the Holy Spirit? Are you the Lord Jesus? He's the only one that can guarantee anything when you talk about people trusting Christ. And I said, no thanks, I don't want some emotional hocus pocus that you put upon the people and hypnotize them or whatever you do and get them to come forward. I don't want that. Amen. So uh, he did not come. I don't believe in emotion. I believe in being emotional. We should get emotional about the Lord Jesus who saved us from our sins, cleanses, saved us from going to a devil's hell. I was thinking this morning in Sunday school, how would you like to be tied to a stake and then pour pile wood up around you and get ready to burn you. I was uh, working with the grill. I'm learning to grill hamburgers. Made some hamburgers and got gout. Thank you. <laughs> got another reoccurrence of gout. This is an evil disease, let me tell you. Anyway, I closed the lid on the grill and it was 550 degrees. It's got a little thom thermometer on it. And I said, my goodness. I can't stand that. It's so hot. And I thought, how about the people who burned at the stake for the cause of Christ and sit there and burned and roasted for the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen, it's not, it's the message they gave that was worth dying for. It's worth suffering for. It's, it's not uh, all about the messenger. It's about the message. And a person who gets behind this pulpit and wants to say, uh, tell all about his life and their testimonies are fine. I mean, the Apostle Paul had to defend himself and, and gave testimony of what God had done for him. Testimonies are fine as long as they're based on the truth. But it's, Paul always got it back to what we're talking about today. The power of God, the messenger, is supposed to bring the message about the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was the second greatest preacher, but his message came from God. It's not by great words used by the messenger. It's not the great wisdom used by the messenger. It's not the messenger declaring to you, but God speaking through the messenger. God speaks through the messenger. Skip down to 1 Corinthians 2, 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Paul was nervous. Paul was nervous. It says here, he was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. Because we are weak in delivery sometimes and we are in fear of failing and 
we tremble at the awesome responsibility of presenting God's Word. Uh, I had a list somewhere of the top ten things people are afraid of, and number one is public speaking, of saying th something stupid. Well, believe me, I'm a public speaker. I say stupid things all the time. It's not that bad. <laughs> I mean, people, they don't remember much about what you said that was right, but they sure remember everything you said that was dumb. Uh, <laughs> So don't be nervous because everybody makes mistakes. And we're, we're just human. Uh, the only person who didn't fail in his preaching was the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul never... Uh, well, he got angry a couple times and misspoke, didn't he? He never misspoke about Christ, though. But people fear misspeaking. And people fear mis misspeaking the message of God. And they're humble and they're uh, present, presenting the message of God. And that was the way Paul was. He was humble in his presentation. He didn't fear misspeaking. They cared, he cared more about the message than himself. And that's how you can, uh, when you preach the gospel, when you're witnessing to someone and sharing the Bible with them, you get so much into the Bible and what you're trying to say and get across to them, as the Holy Spirit touches you, you don't really understand or, or think about people uh, out there and, and you don't really you care more about the message getting across than uh, the people watching you it's never about the messenger it's not about the messenger Paul said I beseech and I brethren when I came to you came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God he declared the truth of God and that's what a messenger of God is supposed to do secondly it's the value of the message 1 Corinthians 2, 2. For I determined not to know anything among you. Paul made a decision early on in his ministry that the message is of vital importance. Paul had a great knowledge of Old Testament and Jewish law. He knew that it's not the amount of knowledge we have, but what we know, and more importantly than that, it's who we know. It's knowing the right things that matter. We can give a great talk, but it might be of no lasting value. We can tell jokes and stories that are memorable, but is, is it of eternal value? It's the value of the message that makes it so important. If I yell fire, and the building is on fire, that's of great value. If I yell ice cream, and the building is on fire, that's, that's going to satisfy us, but it's not going to save us if the building's on fire. It's going to melt the ice cream. It's the value of the message, and Paul knew nothing was of more value than to keep his focus on one thing. Philippians 3, 13, Brethren, I count myself, not myself, to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press on toward the mark of the prize, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul pressed toward the mark. His one goal was to present Jesus Christ. That's our goal when we share our faith with someone. Always bring the conversation to Jesus Christ. All these questions that they might ask, all these things about sidebar issues, bring them back to the cross. That's what Paul did. He brought them back to the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 2 continues. He said, I determined no to know, not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's the value of the message, and no message is more important than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is Christ that Paul preached, and Paul preached Him crucified and risen. There is no message of more importance to the world today than the message of grace and forgiveness of sins. Dallas needs that message. Minneapolis needs that message. Baton Rouge needs that message. By the way, the policemen are nervous. What happens when you put a gun in the hands of a man who's nervous, antsy, not well trained, and a little angry and frustrated? Maybe it, he can't get a better job. Maybe he doesn't like his job. You put a gun in his hand, the slightest movement might get you killed, or the slightest mistake that you make. I'm not saying when all this comes out now, we'll find out probably these guys 
were threatening the police. And we're going to find out more about the story. We always do. But on the surface, it looks like we got nervous policemen. And you can understand that. Five of them just got killed Friday. Or was it Thursday? Five of them killed in Dallas. They can understand they're going to be more nervous now than ever. I don't know what the, yeah, I know what the answer is. The Lord Jesus Christ has to come and bring us peace. We're going to have some problems here of people hating one another and uh, violence. The Bible talks about violence. We're going to see it. So if, if you're thinking about moving to a big city, I would rethink that <laughs> right now. I think it's not a good time. We live in the greatest place in the world. The Muslims don't want to come here. The criminals don't want to come here. There's nothing to steal. Now, there's a few criminals. All we got are the dope heads and the ne'er-do-wells, I guess. It's, but that's we can handle them <laughs> for the most part. Our criminals, one guy I was reading about in Arkansas or somewhere, rural area like this, a bunch of dope heads came to rob him, him and his wife, and he couldn't get to his gun, couldn't get to his butcher knife, but he had his little pet chihuahua, Sally. And she ran off four of these big, brave dope heads. You know, it's, they're not that good at what they do. <laughs> so uh, just, I believe in the Second Amendment. I believe that you can defend yourself biblically if someone breaks into your home. Let's clear that up right now. It's biblical to defend your family and defend your home. So, what are you going to do when they come for your gun? Because that's the bottom line they're going to push to get rid of our guns, which I don't think it will happen once the church is raptured. They'll take every gun that everybody's got. People give them away willingly. But before that, while the church is here, while these true blue believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God, gun-carrying Baptists and whatever we are, Methodists and whatever, whatever we are, we're not going to give our guns, are we? Until they prime from our cold, dead fingers, right? <laughs> That's the way we are. <laughs> I think they better just forget that idea. Number three, and we've got to close. I always say that, but it don't mean anything. It is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. It was not with enticing words. It is the power of God behind the message that makes the message so powerful and so important. The power of God. There are some great speakers out there that can captivate you with their oratory, wit, wisdom, but there is no power of God. They're entertaining but they cannot touch us with God's Spirit because they are not giving us the Word of God. Man can be very enticing and clever in his rhetoric. False preachers are very clever and persuasive, but they do not contain or preach or declare the power of the Word of God through the power of God. They pretend that the power of God is upon them, but that's cleverness also. They're clever. 1 Corinthians 2.4 continues, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. They were delivered in demonstration of the Holy Spirit operating through me and of His power, stirring the minds of listeners and persuading them. There was a preacher from years gone by who would get up and read his sermons and never look up. He wrote his sermons out. He had bad eyesight. He had to get about three inches from the page before he could read it. And the power of God was upon this man. Hundreds of people would come to Christ while he was still preaching because it was the power of God. One guy came up and said, what is this power that you possess? He said, come here a minute. They went downstairs and there was a hundred people praying for him and his message that day and every, that was a revival service for the city and every night there were people praying for him it was the power of God that was touching the people's hearts and it comes through the word of God and the people of God 
praying, humble themselves and praying and seeking the face of the Lord that brings power to the preacher, that brings power to the message and the messenger. Lord, help us to preach in Your power and Your truth, to teach as Sunday school teachers or whatever it is You do, Bible study teacher, that we teach in the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Whatever I can talk you into, someone else can talk you out of. But the power, when it's of God, that says it all. Our faith is not in the wisdom of men, clever arguments, persuasive oratory, impressive rhetoric, or impressive demonstrations. Our faith is in the power of God through the simple preaching of the Gospel. You see, Paul said, I only know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I don't want to give you all these great uh, philosophical things and great stories and uh, all these things that are supposed to touch and move your heart. He just preached Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If that's not enough, I don't know what else is. If that's not enough to save us that Jesus came from glory, lived, walked as a man died on the cross for your sins and mine, took all of our sins upon Himself, and on the third day rose again for our justification before 500 witnesses. He took your sin, your hopeful, hopelessness, that burning, fiery hell, and eventually the lake of fire that we were going to be sent to, He took it upon Himself, our sin debt, and paid it so that we wouldn't have to suffer the agony of separation from God and the wrath of God be poured upon us. You know, we don't understand what the wrath of God is yet. This world will experience it during the tribulation. People experience it when they are cast in the lake of fire. We're not experiencing the wrath of God. We're experiencing the grace of God. God is wanting to imploring people to come to Christ. He's imploring people to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ while you can. Come to me, all you that labor and heavily laden, and I'll give you rest. Come, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Come to me while you can. Don't wait. That's the message of the hour, isn't it, for this day? People are going to wait until it's too late. Too late. Every sign in the in the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Psalms, even all the way back to Deuteronomy and Genesis, is being fulfilled for the return of Christ. Now, Jack, you don't know that. Pick up a newspaper and then pick up your Bible Amen. and you'll see <coughs> the players are in place. <coughs> if you're a chess player or a checkers player, you got to put your players in place before you can win the game. You gotta get them in place. You gotta get ready. You gotta have them in place for your big move. And that's what's happening right now. The devil right now is pouring out his wrath upon man. It's not God. But during the tribulation, the wrath of God is poured out. That's why it's a lot more intense. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God doesn't say anything about falling in the hands of the angry devil. Matter of fact, the devil has no power in hell. He doesn't reign in hell. He's going to be cast in the lake of fire. Amen. Just like all the other people that went against God. He's not the king of hell. Matter of fact, he's not in hell. He's going back and forth from the earth to, to the throne of God, accusing us, challenging God about us. But he knows his time is short. That's why he's working so hard through Islam. That's why he's working through hard, so hard through racial unrest. That's why he's working so hard to cause unrest with migrants in Europe. And why he's working so hard to kill as many as he can in Africa and let them suffer. And North Korea, and how he's risen, risen up that despot so that he can kill as many as he can and send them to hell. And to scare people. Men's hearts failing them. Is that Matthew 24? People are scared to death. Scared to death. Because they don't, they don't know what the future holds. We know what the future holds. Because, because we know who holds the future. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 
Don't fear what men shall do unto you. But fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. But we don't fear that. We don't call out to God. Now I told you a couple weeks ago about the remnant. The remnant of those who trust in Jesus Christ, who kept this world and the wrath of God uh, at bay because they've trusted in Christ and are following Christ and God has restrained the, I should say, the wrath of the devil. Wrath of God doesn't come till the tribulation. But the devil would kill us all if he could and, and destroy everything if he could. But God has restrained him through the Holy Spirit in the presence of the church. When that restrainer is removed through the rapture, that's where you get Revelation 6 through 18 and all uh, the hell on earth poured out. If our faith was in the wisdom of men, it would not stand up to scrutiny. The cults do not stand up to intense scrutiny. There are many, many holes in the wisdom of men because men don't know everything. For every great argument, there's another one just as good over here on the other side. For this guy comes back, this guy comes back. And you're going, I don't know what to believe. Yes, you do. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in the Word of God. No, we don't know all the things that are going to happen in the future. No, we don't know all the answers, but we know one who does. And He told us that God created the, the earth in six days, and I believe it's literal days, because God can do it. I believe in the creation story. Matter of fact, I believe in Noah's Ark. And we need to go visit Noah's Ark. We can do that now. July 7th was the opening of the Ark Encounter in Williamstown, Kentucky. Matter of fact, that's where Brother Carl Mullins is going to be. Uh, that's where his funeral will be. He's going to be buried in Breathitt County, by the way. That's where his family is from. But the Ark Encounter opened to 7,000 visitors last week. It's the largest wooden structure, all wooden structure in the world. And they can get 7, 000, they can get 5,000 people in the Ark at one time. That's what it's... Uh, the fire marshal allow, will allow them to put in there at one time. 5,000 people in the ark. And we need to have a church outing and go there and support them. It's $40 to get in. Consider that money well invested in the work. This living testimony to the Word of God. That's what I like about it. It's a living testimony to rebuke all those and rebuff all those who say it couldn't be done and it can't work, but this is the testimony that it can work and the animals can fit in there and the animals can be safe and God can do this and God did it. It has a gospel presentation. It all is Bible-based. There's a creation museum a few miles away from that. That is, we still haven't been there yet. We need to do both things if we go. And we need to go uh, tomorrow. Let's get up a group. And uh, as soon as we can, seriously. Uh, we need to go and support that. And I want to see it. I think it would be uh, fabulous. And support people that believe in the Bible and the Word of God. Bill Nye, the science guy, was there Friday. He, uh, Ken Ham, the founder of Answers in Genesis, who's behind the Ark Encounter in the Creation Museum, invited him to come, and he came Friday. I'm interested to see what he said about it. Uh, I know he thinks it's awful that we're teaching children to believe in the Bible. God have mercy on people who believe in the Bible. That's a contradiction, isn't it? <laughs> That's what people say. I've had people tell me, I don't care if it's in the Bible or not. I don't believe it's that way. Listen. It's amazing what God does in the midst of all this sin and rejection of God and rejection of moral standards. I haven't even got into that yet. I talk about that enough. All the rejection of morality. Here is an ark. That represents the ark of safety we have in Jesus Christ. That ark encounter, I'm not saying it's something mystical. I'm just saying it stands for something. That in the midst of all this hell on earth, all this immorality, here's an ark in the great commonwealth of Kentucky. I'm proud 
I'm not supposed to have pride. I'm not supposed to be proud. But I'm happy <laughs> that the ark is in Kentucky. Kentucky. The only state that has enough sense to build an ark. <laughs> and I hope it floats. We may need it. But the uh, bad thing is the next time the world's going to be uh, destroyed by fire. So the ark probably be one of the first things to go. right? But the thing is, it stands there, the ark of Jesus Christ, the ark of safety. God took Noah and his family, put them in the ark, and he shut the door, and he provided for them. Not one drop of water got on the people in the ark. They were dry. Read how many times it says dry in Genesis, uh, the Noah's flood in Genesis chapter 7 and 8. Read how many times dry. They never had a drop of water on them. When you're in the ark of safety in Christ, you are safe from the effects of sin, the power of sin, and the rule of sin, and the destiny of sinners. You are safe in the ark of Jesus Christ. And that's, my friends, is the greatest thing about the Lord Jesus Christ. Is He saves, He keeps us safe, it's all because of the power of God and it's all about the message of God that we preach. We'll never stop preaching this message. The power of God behind the man is what makes the message. If it's God approved and according to thus saith the Lord, then listen to that person. Listen to that person. The power of God is in the Word of God given, us, given to us by the only God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray.